victims of uh, this scourge are not only dealing with the trauma and pain, but how their cases are handled in court is important. Most of the victims uh, rely on the state to assist in the preparation of their cases for successful prosecution. Now, this is another hurdle that some of the vulnerable have to face on a daily basis, uh, which is going to court and telling what happened to them. Well, joining us now uh, to take us through uh, what the National Prosecuting Authority is doing to assist these victims, in particular uh, preparing them for court, is Karen Chusen. She is the Deputy Director at, uh, for the Division of Court Preparation within the NPA. Karen, a very good morning to you. Thank you very much for making uh, the time to speak to us First question I want to ask of you is, do you think that victims of gender-based violence are aware of the services that you offer? Oh, I sincerely hope so, because the services is critical. However, I, do, I really do not think that everybody is aware of the services that are offered. Um, I think we need to really, and I appreciate this opportunity, to share with our hurting community, mm. those that suffer harm of the services that are available. Yeah. Very simply, Karen, tell us what the duties of a court preparation officer is. Um, what we discovered is that people are afraid of the trial, the criminal justice system, the whole process. Mm. And if they're not adequately supported, they will not come forward, they will not open a case, they um, will not have their voice heard in court. And the court preparation officer, which is the official um, based at a sexual offence court um, or any regional court, mm. um, however, not all over the country yet, but the majority of the sexual offence courts, they will be there to receive those uh, witnesses. They'll even contact the victim beforehand mm. and uh, make sure that they are um, in a safe place. They have to be in a safe place to know and have the courage to tell very intimate details in front of strangers. Mm. So in light of that, they have to really um, contact them, find out what are their special needs, what are their fears, are they disabled, are they in a wheelchair, are they diabetic, mm. is there a special need, and address their needs before they come to court. Yeah. When they come to court, they empower them with an understanding of the processes that they're going to engage with. Mm -hmm. They will show them the courtroom, the court environment, where they're going to testify. Mm -hmm. If they're going to testify in an intermediary room, they will empower them to cope in the court um, in, a, in a wonderful way. And it gives them a voice. Um, I, I can't, I wish I had the words to explain the transformation of somebody who has the services of a court preparation officer all their fears and concerns are addressed. Yeah. Um, transportation, food, testifying, and then afterwards refer them for counseling and therapy, which is a places of safety, which is very, very important. Yeah. Ha -ha. Um, I just need to say the other aspect that they help them with mm. is a new thing that's um, entitled for all the gender-based violence victims of crime and um, and the families, the families are also support, supported. It's called a victim impact statement. Mm -hmm. The victim impact statement is new and they can write their own statement in their own words where they tell the court their fears, their nightmares, how the crime has affected them, this whole thing. And it's admissible. So the magistrate will use that in light of the sentencing at the end of the trial. Mm. So it's very empowering. It's bibliotherapy. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're painting a picture of someone very empathetic, someone who almost is able to say to the victim, 
I, I can walk in your shoes. I, I think I understand your journey. The, the, the important element here, Karen, is that victims often very vulnerable and when they're going to appear in that courtroom, um, you've already described what the duties of this court preparation officer are, but how easily accessible are these people? Because oftentimes, as we know, with government officials, they will be there, but um, they may not be easy to find because it's, it's just an arduous a journey trying to locate someone in a courtroom mm -hmm. or in a government office, perhaps. I hear you. Um, in terms of accessibilities, we, we have received a funding through the Gender-Based Violence um, Emergency Fund availed by our, our president, and we are appointing 114 additional staff. Uh, we have 166 throughout the country, mm. and they're all based at every single sexual offence court. You get a pure sexual offence court and a hybrid sexual offence court. But the, but when they, when the the person that needs assistance comes to court, they can ask security for the senior public prosecutor at that particular court, mm. and then that senior public prosecutor will refer them to the court preparation officer. Mm -hmm. We are trying to make posters available at the entrances of courts um, to make them aware that they have a right. We've got posters and pamphlets that are out there. Yeah. But generally they have to ask uh, for the services of a, sexual, of a court prep. But what we also do is if there's a need and they go to a court where there is no court preparation officer, so they can still ask the prosecutor um, to refer them to the nearest or arrange for a court preparation officer to assist them in their own language. Yeah. All right. Uh, Karen Chusen, I, I see that uh, I think you may have pressed something there or it's possibly uh, on our side. But uh, let's see. If we there can continue the it's conversation, back. there we are. Uh, we've got you back yeah. now. All right. So as we conclude our discussion, the the importance, Karen, of capacitating all these courts, because just to remind the viewer again, you're saying that these court preparation officers are found in sexual offences courts uh, around the provinces. Firstly, are they available? Yeah. Uh, the sexual offences courts in all nine provinces? Yes, there are. Um, they are in every single province. There are certain courts. I've got a list of them here. Um, 25, 34. There's a whole lot um, of dedicated pure sexual offences court. Mm. However, other courts also deal with sexual offence cases, uh, yeah. such as gender-based violence. It's all included there. All right. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps finally, when that moment comes, the victim is in court and has to come face-to-face -face with the perpetrator. How is that experience for the victim? Um, it's very traumatic. That's one of the roles of the court preparation officers to sit with them in court as a support person after they've prepared them for court. Mm. And also we have measures to protect, protective measures. The law allows for protective measures for that um, person that has to testify in court. However, after, after they've received the empowerment of court preparation, they, they more often than not have the courage to look the perpetrator in the eye and say, this is what you've done for me, no more. You're not going to do it to others. You're not going to get away with it. And here is my story. And in a very empowered way, they tell the presiding officer, they tell the court, they tell the accused, they tell defense exactly what happened to them, the effects on their lives, and they will stand up and say no more, it is enough.
Mm. So the empowerment aspect and the closure aspect of telling their story in court is profound and phenomenal. We in the, in the um, courts call it um, therapeutic jurisprudence. We want them to be able to stand up and be counted. Yeah. We had 41 children, 99 children that were um, raped. 41 had to testify and all 41 testified in court in front of the accused in high court with confidence and empowerment and they didn't even want to use the intermediary facility they told it as it was wow. and he was convicted um, which was brilliant so mm. yes there's an empowerment aspect and a healing aspect therapeutic aspect of testifying and they need to know this if they don't know it, they will stay trapped mm. forever uh, Karen Chusen, I can't let you go without asking whether you think you are adequately funded. These are very important people that assist, that assist uh, the victims. Are, are you adequately funded to have more of these court preparation officers? Uh, my answer is going to be no. Um, because if, if you look at how many courts in the country, we've got 400 courts, we need 400 uh, court preparation officers, and we need two per court. That's that's blueprint requirement. However, National Treasury and Parliament is now beginning to see the value because we work in a multidisciplinary team, the prosecutor, the magistrate, the, um, the intermediary, the work of the court preparation officer is critical in the um, successful prosecutions and if we don't get successful prosecutions these perpetrators are going to walk away and continue reaping havoc on our country so they are becoming aware but we are reliant on the CARA funding um, to support especially for training equipping um, and treasury to allocate um, specialized funding for the services, very critical. So we need to really engage with Treasury and um, promote the services and ask them to fund. We don't have enough. We don't even have food for the witnesses when they come to court. And the court preparation officers often fork out of their own pocket to feed those witnesses that travel maybe three hours mm. to get to court. Mm. Yeah, that's... That's just our experience in our country. Karen Chusen, thank you very much for making time to speak to us. She's a deputy director for court preparation sitting at the National Prosecuting Authority. Thanks indeed for your time.